good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this e evening. Um, in tonight's lecture, um, I will be uh, I'll be bowling the first over. We will be covering laws 12, 13, 14, 17 and 18. I'll do the first three laws, then I'll hand over to Tom to do 17 and 18. And then we will open the floor for Q&A. Uh, to kick off tonight's session, I will go over the quickly over the revision questions that we uh, covered on um, last week, Wednesday. So the first uh, revision question that we dealt with was uh, four breaks that are classified as uh, scheduled intervals, and they are period between close of play on day one and the start of the next day's play, interval between innings, uh, intervals for tea and uh, lunch, intervals for drinks, and lastly, any other agreed interval. Second of the revision questions was the two umpires arrive at the field and you then notice on day one that the curator is still rolling uh, the pitch. So the game starts at 10 o'clock on day one. You arrive at the field, let's say 8.30, and you still see the curator rolling the pitch. So what would you do? You will take no action. So before the game starts and up until the toss, the curator, he, he or she is responsible for the selection and preparation of the pitch. And once the game starts, or once the toss takes place on day one, only after that is the umpires in charge of the pitch's use as well as the maintenance. Last um, of the revision questions that we uh, handled last week, Wednesday. So now the ground has been handed over to the umpires. So the maintenance of the playing area now becomes the responsibility of the umpires. So what is the maximum time allowed for rolling? Maximum of seven minutes allow is allowed for rolling. So you can roll five minutes, four minutes, one minute, as long as you do not exceed a maximum of seven minutes. So in terms of timings, what is the uh, when is the earliest and what is the latest times for a pitch to be rolled on any other day during a game? This is now uh, day two, day three, day four and day five if, it, uh, if, it, uh, if the game is a test match. So in the previous questions, we saw maximum of seven minutes. So this, uh, this seven minutes will happen. And there is a window period if the game starts at uh, 10 o'clock, so not more than 30 minutes before the game is supposed to start and not later than 10 minutes. So your window period is between, if the game starts at 10, from 9.30 till 9.50. The latest that the captain can request rolling is 9.50. And lastly, in terms of mowing of the pits, what time should the mowing be done? So if the game starts at 10 o'clock, mowing of the pits needs to be done before 9.30. So that, though, these were the revision questions that we dealt with last week. So I'm starting off with law number 12, which is about the start of play and the cessation of play. So the call of play. So, so the bowlers in umpire needs to call play at the start of the game. And EOC needs to call play on the resumption after any interval or interruption. So when, when the game starts, day one, if the game starts at 10 o'clock, the bowlers and umpire needs to call play before the first ball of the over is bowled. And let's say you take lunch at 12 o'clock. Lunch is 40 minutes, so you'll restart at 12.40. Before the first ball is bowled after, after lunch, 
the bowlers and umpire needs to call play. The same principle apply if there was an interruption, let's say for rain, for rain, you go off. If you come back before that first ball is bowled, after the rain interruption, the bowlers and umpire needs to call play. The same applies for the calling of time. So again, the bowlers and umpire needs to call time. And the it's very important that, that before you call time, the bowlers and umpire needs to wait until the ball is dead. So once the ball is dead, the bowlers and umpire needs to call time on the cessation of play before any interval or interruption or at the conclusion of the game. So, so if I can use a test match as an example, play starts at 10, lunch is at 12 o'clock. So now you've reached 12 o'clock mm -hmm. and now it's time to go for lunch. When the ball is dead, uh, up, uh, needs to the call the time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can hear a bit of background noise. Do you mind muting your mic, please? Yes, will remember that he's serious. Uh, do you mind muting your mic, please? Thank you so much. So just to recap, the bowlers in umpire needs to call time when the ball is dead at the cessation of play before any interval or interruption or at the end of the game. Once time has been called, the bales needs to be removed from both wickets. If I can use lunch as an example, uh, you've now reached 12 o'clock. The bowlers in umpire will now call um, over time and lunch. So, so now you've called time. So what now needs to happen? The bales needs to be removed and they then needs to be removed from both wickets. So starting a new over. So if I can use a test match as an example. So the, the morning session is from 10 o'clock till 12 o'clock. So the law tells us that you will always start a new over. Uh, or let me rephrase. Another over shall be started at any time during the game unless an interval is to be taken. So what this means is if lunch is at 12 o'clock and now you've you will call over and you look at your watch and you see it's now 11.59. Can you take lunch? No, you cannot take lunch yet because it is only 11.59. So what do you do? So the law tells us that the umpire needs to walk at normal pace and if the umpire arrives behind the stumps at the bowler's end before 12 o'clock, another over needs to, to start. So if, if I can use an example, so now you've, it's the end of the over, you've called, you've called over, you've looked at your watch, you see it's 11.59. So what you, what you now need to do is, the you as uh, that was behind bowlers in uh, that was the bowlers in umpire now needs to start walking at normal pace towards the the strikers or towards square leg. The strikers in umpire of the previous over now needs to walk at normal pace towards the bowlers in. If the umpire now gets to behind the stumps before the watch reaches 12 o'clock, another over needs to be started. If the umpire does not get there, if the watch goes 12 o'clock before he or she gets behind the stumps, you need to call time and lunch. Completion of an over. Other than at the end of the game, uh, over shall always be completed, except, and we'll get to the exception now. So what I mean by an over needs to be completed, 
if lunch is let's say at 12 o'clock and you've now reached 12 o'clock, but only three balls have been bowled. Do you now, uh, because it's 12 o'clock, do you leave the field and take lunch? No, law tells us that that over needs to be completed. So you will complete the further three balls of the over. And let's say you now go go past uh, 12 o'clock by three minutes. So the, the over ends at three minutes past 12. That is fine. You will then call over time and lunch. You will then remove both uh, bales from uh, each set of wickets. Because you've stopped 12.03, what time will lunch end? Lunch will end at 12.43, or the first ball needs to be bowled at 12.43. Okay, but there is an exception. So we've now agreed that that over needs to be completed, but let's see what the exception is. If less than three minutes remains before the agreed time for the interval and a batter is dismissed or the batter retires or the players needs to leave the field for whatever reason, if that happens, so less than three minutes, there's either a, a dismissal or retirement of a batter or the players needs to leave the field, what will you then do? lunch will then be taken immediately. So the key thing here is it needs to be less than three minutes. So if you lunch is at 12 o'clock and at 11.58 a wicket uh, gets taken off, let's say the fourth ball of uh, the over, you will not complete those two balls. You will take the lunch immediately because law tells us if less than three minutes remains before the agreed time for, for lunch, you will then take lunch. So at 11.58, the wicket fell, you will take lunch immediately. What time will you return or what time will the four, first ball needs to be bowled after lunch? That is correct, 40 minutes later. So at 12.38, the first ball needs to be bowled. So now at 12.38, you've now um, going to bowl the first ball. The law tells us that, remember, you took the wicket off the fourth ball of the over before lunch. So you took an, uh, you took lunch, but there are still two balls that needs to be bowled. Those two balls, or the over, needs to be completed on the resumption of play. So that means after lunch, you first need to complete the previous over so that two balls needs to be bowled. And once the two balls is bowled, you can then start the next over. Last hour of the match. And this last hour refers to the last hour of the game. So if it's a five day test match and let's say the start of play is at 10 o'clock and close of play is at five o'clock. So this last hour of the game refers to on day five, the last hour of the game. So what is the last hour on day five? From four o'clock till five o'clock. That is what this last hour refers to. It does not refer to the last hour of each day. It refers to the last hour of the match. So in my example, the test match, the last hour of the test match is, um, if the end of play is five o'clock, so that last hour uh, will be from four o'clock till five o'clock. The law tells us that in that last hour, you need to, the fielding side needs to bowl a minimum of 20 overs as per the law, or unless the result is reached, the fielding side needs to bowl a minimum of 20 overs in that last hour. If they do not bowl a minimum of 20 overs once the the five o'clock has been reached. The uh, play needs to continue until they bowl 20 overs. Examples, if they, the last hour starts at four o'clock, at five o'clock only 16 overs has been bowled. What do you do? Is that the end of the game? No, it's not the end of the game. The law tells us in that last hour, a minimum of 20 overs needs to be bowled. 
So they so they've only built 16 overs when you got to 12 o'clock. So four overs still needs to be built. So play will continue until that four overs are built. Another example. Let's say uh, last hour started at six, at 1600 hours. At 1650, the fielding side completed the 20 overs. What do you do? Is that the end of the game? No, it's not the end of the game. The cessation time is five o'clock. Yes, they've bowled 20 overs already, but we have not reached our cessation time yet. So play needs to continue until five o'clock. So when is the game concluded? So the, the match is concluded. As soon as the result is reached. So in in the in the fourth innings of the game, the uh, the side B needs to score 200 to win. They then score the 200. Uh, sorry, they they had 196. Uh, the better then uh, it's the four to get to 200. As soon as the winning runs is score is scored, the match is concluded. The match is also concluded. As soon as both the minimum numbers of overs in the last hour are completed and, and also the agreed close of play time has been reached unless the result has been reached earlier. So the game is concluded if that 20 overs in the last hour has been bowled and uh, five o'clock has been reached in, in our previous uh, example, example. The game is then concluded. Also, in the case of an agreement under law 13.1.2, so as soon as the final innings is completed, the match is concluded, we will deal with law 13.1.2 in detail uh, in the next uh, law. And we will see exactly uh, what is meant by if there is an agreement um, under law 13. And as soon as that agreement has been reached, the game is also concluded. I'll go into uh, more detail in the next law. Lastly, the game is also concluded if without a conclusion having been reached under the first three points above, the players then, there's a need for the players to leave the field due to adverse conditions of ground, weather uh, or light. Uh, meaning, uh, let's say side A needs to score 200 to win. They then 150 for three. They have not reached 200 yet. The It now starts to, to rain. This is now on, on day five and it uh, rains for, and let's say uh, it starts raining at three o'clock, side, side B needs 200 to win, they are 150 for three, it starts raining at three, and then it rains for the rest of the afternoon. So i.e. no further play possible. So because we've now reached our cessation time of five o'clock, the game is concluded. The innings. So the number of innings. So again, this is we co we we covering more day cricket here. So uh, this match is a typical example. We're not referring to to um, 50 over cricket or T20 cricket. And in more day cricket, uh, most of the times it gets played over uh, two innings for each side. Sometimes uh, can be one innings, but usually it is uh, two innings for each side. So it may be agreed to limit any innings to a number of overs or to a period of time. If such agreement is made, then in a one innings match, a similar agreement shall apply to both innings. Or in a two innings match, similar agreement may apply 
to either the first innings of each side or even the second innings of each side or both innings of each side. I'll give you an example of this. And uh, um, in the uh, local competition in Cape Town a few years ago when uh, when there was still two day cricket played, the playing condition states that in the first innings of of the game, the first innings was restricted to 60 overs per side. So once 60 overs was completed, that first innings came to an end. So if side A was uh, was at 200 for the last of two wickets and, they, and 60 overs was reached, that was the end of the, f the first innings of side A, that innings then was concluded, side B will then have to come in to face 60 overs as well. So the point that uh, I'm trying to make and the point that uh, point number two here is saying that in a two innings match, you may agree to limit the innings to a number of overs. Like in, in my example, it was agreed that for the playing condition states that the first innings uh, was a maximum of 60 overs, or you may decide a period of time. Let's say the first inning shall be three hours for each side. Uh, it just depends uh, what the playing condition for that particular competition um, um, is. So the law allows for this. The law allows that you can do it to the first innings. The law allows that you can do it to a um, to both innings of each game. You, you can, for example, go 60 overs in the first innings for each side, and you can go 50 overs in the second innings for each side. You can maybe go time. Th three hours for each side in the first innings and let's say four hours for for each side in uh, the second uh, innings. So now to go back to the previous slide, point number three where, where it said, if there's a case of an agreement under law 13.1.2, so as soon as the final innings is completed, so in the example I just used, let's say the, 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 the first innings um, of the game was restricted to 60 overs per side and the second innings to 50 overs per side. So point three here is saying if in the second innings of side B, they've now batted for 50 overs. So as soon as they've reached 50 overs and the result was not reached, that innings is then uh, finished and the game is concluded. Law also tells us that in a two innings match, each side needs to rotate the innings, except, and I'll get to the except, so side A needs to go back once uh, the innings is completed, side B then needs to go in, and then once the innings is completed, Side A needs to go and then side B. So you need to alternate each innings. You need to rot rotate the innings, except in cases of follow ons or forfeiture of an innings. So in case there's a follow on, then the other side can go back again, or if there's a forfeiture, otherwise each side needs to rotate each of the innings. When is an innings completed? A side innings is considered to be completed if the side is all out. So the fielding side uh, took 10 wickets, that innings of the batting side is completed. The side innings is also completed if at the fall of a wicket or at the retirement of a batter, Further balls remain to be bowled, but no further batter is available to come in. An example of uh, this is, let's say the uh, opening bat got bowled again, his, uh, his uh, finger, he retired hurt, uh, finger, let's say, is broken, um, he left, uh, he retired his innings, he then, uh, the fielding side then uh, took wickets uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
and when they took the ninth uh, wicket, the captain of the, the batting side said because of the injury to the opening bat, his, let's say his finger is broken, he's not able to resume his innings. So in that case, that innings will then be completed, even though only nine wickets was, was uh, uh, the fielding side only took nine wickets, the innings uh, will be completed if there uh, the are still balls to be bowled, but no further batter is available to come in. The innings is also completed if the captain declares the innings closed. The innings is also completed if the captain forfeits the innings. And in the case of an agreement that we dealt with in the previous uh, slide, where the uh, where I said uh, the first innings may be restricted to a maximum of let's say 50 or 60 overs. So as soon as that uh, maximum overs has been reached, so in the first innings, let's say it's 60 overs, as soon as 60 overs has been completed, the innings of that batting side is completed, even though they, they're not all out. Let's say they're 200 for two of the 60 overs. Once 60 overs has been reached, because of that agreement, the innings is completed. The same principle applied if the time has expired, if, if there was an agreement that the first innings should only be three hours long, as soon as you've reached three hours, the innings of the batting side is completed. The toss. Who shall toss? Where shall they toss? Who needs to be present? And what are the timings of the toss? According to the law, the captains shall toss for the choice of innings. Where do they need to, to, to toss? The law tells us it needs to happen on the field of play. So anywhere on the field of play, the toss can happen. But we all know that tradition is that the toss takes place next to the, uh, the match pitch. Who needs to be present? So we, we know that the captains needs to be there. And either one or both umpires also needs to be present at the toss. So now we need we know both captains and at least one umpire. We know it needs to happen on the field of play. And the timings of the, the toss, there is a window period. It, it says not earlier than 30, not later than 15 minutes before the scheduled or rescheduled time for the game to start. So that window period is if the game starts at 10 o'clock, the window period for the toss to take place is any time between 9.30 and 9.45. In practice, I prefer the toss to, have, to take place as soon as possible. So as soon as 9.30 is reached, I, I, I want the captains to toss. It just gives everyone uh, time to, to get ready. It gives the opening batters time to, to, to pair up, uh, you know, to, to get themselves uh, mentally ready. It gives the bowlers um, as well time to do a bit of a warm up. So the window period for the toss is 9.30 till 9.45. So now, captain of, let's say, side A is won the toss. So the law tells us that as soon as the toss has been completed, the captain of the side winning the toss, he or she needs to inform the opposing captain and the umpires whether he or she is going to bat or field. And once notified, the captain cannot change his or her decision. So as soon as the toss has been completed, the, the captain who won the toss needs to tell, inform his counterpart and the umpires, is he, whether he's batting or bowling. He cannot, he or she cannot tell you, uh, just wait, give me uh, two minutes. I, I want to go quickly discuss this with my coach or my, my, my fellow teammates. No, the captain winning the toss needs to inform his counterpart and the umpires 
immediately as soon as the toss is completed. The follow on. So in a two innings match of five days or more, the side that bats first and they lead by at least 200 runs on the first innings, that side or that captain have the option of asking the opposing captain or opposing side to follow on. It is an option, doesn't have to enforce the follow on, but the option is available to the captain. So in terms of follow on, in a five day game or more, the side that bats first needs to lead by at least 200 runs. And if that is the case, that captain shall have the option to ask his counterpart to follow on. An example of this, side A uh, bats and they score 600 for the uh, all out. They then dismissed side B for 300 runs. Can the, the captain of side, side A enforce the follow on? Yes, the captain can, because the law tells us, and, and, and we'll use a five day test match as an example. So, in a five day test match, the lead, the lead must be at least 300 runs. In my example, what is the lead? The uh, side A scored 300, sorry, 600. They dismiss side B for 300. So the lead in this case is 300. So yes, the captain of side A has the option to enforce the follow on. Doesn't have to, but the option is available to side A. So it, the lead needs to be at least three, 200 in a five day uh, in a test match. If it's anything less than 200, the option is not available for the captain to enforce the follow on. An example of this, so side A scores 600, uh, side A then dismiss, dismisses uh, side B for 401. So now the captain of side A comes to you and tells you he wants to enforce the follow on. What will your answer be? The first thing you need to ask yourself is what is the lead? In this example, the lead is 600 minus 401, so the lead is 199. So can side, uh, the captain of side A enforce the follow on? No, he cannot, because the lead needs to be at least 200. So in this case, is 199. If side A dismissed side B for 400, and if let's say they scored 600 and they miss side B for 400. Can the captain of side A enforce the follow on? Yes, the captain can. Why? What is the lead in my last example? Side A scored 600. The lead was uh, the, they dismissed side B for 400. So the lead is 200. So the law tells us if the lead is at least 200. Yes, they, the captain then have the option of enforcing the follow on doesn't have to, but the option is there to enforce the follow on. So that is five day uh, cricket or more. The same option applies in a two innings match. If the lead is 150 runs in a match of three or four days, 100 runs in a two day game, 75 runs in a one day game. So the same principle applies here, just the days are, are less. So in point number one, uh, it's in the two innings games of five days or more, which is typical uh, of a test match, there the lead needs to be 200. In a three or four day game, the lead needs to be 100 or at least 150. 
in a two day uh, match, the lead needs to be at least 100 runs. And in a one day game, the lead needs to be at least 75 runs. This one day game does not refer to a 50 over or 20 over game. Sometimes uh, in some competitions, you do find uh, two innings is being played uh, um, um, in one day. Um, there's uh, obviously restrictions. You'll find maybe the first innings being restricted to 40 overs per side, and the, and the the second innings to uh, to maybe 45 overs or 50 overs uh, per side. So you can have a four innings uh, match being completed in one day. So in those instances, if it's a one day game, the minimum or the side needs to lead by at least 200. Uh, at least 75 runs. So the, the captain, if the captain wants to enforce the follow on, the captain needs to shall need to notify the opposing uh, captain as well as the umpires if he or she wants to take up uh, this option. And once notified, if the captain wants to enforce the follow on or if he doesn't uh, want to enforce the follow on, that decision can then not be changed. So once he's, let's say, he, uh, EOC decided to enforce the follow on and the uh, captains and umpires were informed, the captain can then not change his uh, decision. So in the previous slide, we spoke about what the minimum lead or the lead needs to be uh, if the uh, captain wants to enforce the follow on. But point number three is, is saying that if no play takes first, takes play on the first day of the game. So no play needs to take place on day one of a particular game, and let's use a test match as an example. So test match, five days, if no play takes place on day one, not a single ball was bowled on day, on day one. The law then say that in terms of the, the follow on, you then need to look at the remaining days that are left, and then apply the then apply the lead or the lead needs to be then at least that number for that particular uh, days that are left. I'll use an example to illustrate what the law is trying to say. So in a five day test match, what does the minimum lead or what does the side um, need to lead by to enforce the follow on? 200. So now the law tells us if no play takes place on, on day one, not a single ball was bowled on day one of the five day test match, how many days are then remaining in the test match? So there are four days then remaining in the test match. So now the law tells us that the side now needs to lead by at least 150 runs to be able to enforce the follow on. So you now go to 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 look at what the the lead needs to be in a in a three or four day game, or if it's a two day match, it, it, um, the lead then needs to be 100 runs, and if it's a one day game, the uh, the lead then needs to be 75 runs. But the crucial part here is it must be the first day of that particular game. No play needs to happen on the first day of that particular game and in our example the test match let's say play took place on day one of the test match but day two has been ra uh, rained out not a single ball was bowled on day two and now you start uh, day three at let's say 10 o'clock what needs to be the minimum lead if the side if uh, the side wants to enforce the follow-on it will stay 200 uh, runs uh, why? The law tells us that it needs to be day one when no play needs to take place. In our example, day one uh, play took place. It, it was day 
two that was rained out and play only restarted on day three. But day one, we had a full day on day one. And because we had a full day on day one, for a side to enforce the follow on, the lead needs to be at least 200 runs. That same principle applies to a three or four day game or a two day game. Uh, Tom, that is my few laws that I'm covering for this evening. I um, mean, it's end of my over, so I'm calling uh, um, over. And you need to bowl the, the next over from the other side. Over to you, Tom. Thanks, Tula. And good evening to the candidates. I will be going through laws 17 and 18, and then we shall be going through revision slides for these laws that we have covered today. So law 17 is the over. How many balls or legal deliveries in an over? Yes, you all know, six deliveries constitute an over. The ball shall be bowled from each end alternately in overs of six balls. What that means is that after I've bowled six balls from one end, then Abdullah will bowl six balls from the other end. You cannot have two consecutive overs from a similar end unless they are two different innings. How does an over start? An over is started when the bowler starts his run-up or if he or she has no run-up, his or her bowling action for the first delivery of that over. What is a bowling action? Law defines the start of a bowling action as when the bowler enters his or her delivery stride and the delivery stride starts with the back foot landing, usually close to the bowling crease, just behind or just after the bowling crease, depending on the length of the bowler's delivery stride. Mentioned that we need six legal deliveries to constitute an over. So what are valid deliveries that will constitute an over? Well, firstly, the ball needs to be delivered by the bowler. And it won't count in the following incidents. If it is called dead or is to be considered dead before the striker has had an opportunity to play it. If it is called dead and in the circumstances of law 20.4.2.5, the striker is not ready for the delivery, or 24.4.2.6, the striker was distracted while receiving a delivery. In these two occasions, the ball shall not count as a legal delivery in the over. If it is a no ball or a wide, we all know those deliveries also need to be re -bowled. Then we have some other laws whereby the delivery has been bowled, but needs to be re -bowled. This is usually when a fielder has contravened the laws. Law 24.4 player returning without permission and coming into contact with the ball. Law 28.2, illegal fielding by a fielder. This, for example, is if a fielder were to take his cap off his head and stretch out to elongate his or her reach and catch the ball using the cap in his hand. That would constitute illegal fielding, and that ball would not count as a legal delivery in the over. Deliberate attempt to distract the striker. Again, infringement by a fielder will end up with the ball having to be re -bowled. Deliberate distraction, deception, or obstruction of a batsman. Those 
also result in the ball having to be re bowled We would have seen many years ago, say about 10 years ago, what used to be called mock fielding came into play, um, whereby if a batter, for example, hits a ball towards third man, the gully fielder rushes towards the ball, but in seeing that he cannot field the ball, he slides and fakes a pickup and throw towards either end to prevent the batters from running. That is called mock fielding, and that is a deliberate deception of a batter, or at least a deliberate attempt. And there again, the ball shall not count as one of the over if the umpires intervene. Uh, if the batters are not confused and the single is taken to third man, as would normally have happened without the intervention of the gully fielder, then the umpires can just give a quiet warning to that fielder or the captain or both that mock fielding is not allowed. However, if the batters were indeed deceived by that mock fielding, then the umpires would definitely have to intervene. Call and signal dead ball. Call and signal five penalty runs to the batting side. And the batters would even have the choice of who faces the next delivery. And as mentioned, that delivery would not count as one valid ball in the over. And of course, the most obvious point about any delivery to count as a valid delivery in the over, it needs to have been delivered first and foremost. Any deliveries other than those listed on the previous slide shall be known as valid deliveries. Only valid balls shall count towards the six of the over. When six valid deliveries have been bowled, and when the ball becomes dead, the umpire shall call over before leaving the wicket. Very important, I think there was a question on the chat group just now about whether an umpire should call over and time. Um, does that constitute the ball being dead? Um, no, it does not. So. An umpire needs to wait until the ball is dead before calling over and if it's the end of the session before calling time. Okay, um, do not be in a rush to call over. Um, there is no rush in an over or to complete an over. So wait and make sure that everybody has considered the ball to be dead before you call it dead and call over. What happens if umpires miscount? And unfortunately, this does happen in 40 degree heat on a long day. And if there are no balls and wides in a specific over, and maybe a lot of fours and sixes, it can happen that us as umpires miscount. What does the law tell us to do when we have miscounted? If the umpire miscounts the number of valid balls, the over as counted by the umpire shall stand. If having miscounted, the umpire allows an over to continue after six valid deliveries have been bowled, he or she may subsequently call over as the ball becomes dead after any delivery, even if that delivery is not a valid ball. So let me give an example to illustrate this point. If we have bowled six legal deliveries and the seventh delivery is a no ball, then my partner and I realize after having called no ball that we have in fact had six legal deliveries before the no ball. 
law allows us to then call over and not to allow a seventh legal delivery to be bold. Okay, there's going to be a lot of confusion and there's going to be a lot of people um, asking questions. The batters will specifically be unhappy if it's a limited overs match because we will now be robbing them of a free hit. However, the law tells us that we must correct our mistake once we have figured out that we have indeed bowled six legal deliveries. Just a couple of pointers from level one about how to make sure that you do not miscount. Uh, we at club cricket level uh, signal uh, three balls left in the over to our partners by putting your left or right arm on your waist. Uh, that shows that we are halfway through the over. The signal for two is a peace sign, basically two fingers up in the air, again towards your partner so that the two of you can confirm. And then normally on the last ball, we fill in our bowling cards if you are at the striker's end umpire. And if I'm at bowler's end umpire, I put out my index finger um, round about stomach height to show everybody, not just my partner, but also players. They always ask that there's one bowler, sorry, one ball left in the over. Um, what's also important is if there is a no ball, dead ball, or a wide ball in the over, or a wicket for that matter, you need to confirm with your partner after each of those incidents how many balls are left in the over. That way, you are negating the loss of counting for those extra deliveries that might have to be bowled. Okay, so after a no ball, after a wide, after a dead ball, and Definitely after a wicket, confirm how many balls are left in the over with your partner, even if it was the first ball of the over. Okay. Bowler changing ends. A bowler shall be allowed to change ends as often as desired, provided that he or she does not bowl two overs consecutively nor bowl parts of each of two consecutive overs in the same innings. Therefore, not allowed to bowl any part of two consecutive overs in an innings. And we will go into a little bit more detail on this when we go through a bowler becoming incapacitated in an over and having to be replaced by another bowler to complete that over. How do we finish an over? Other than at the end of an innings, a bowler shall finish an over in progress unless he is incapacitated or suspended under the laws of cricket. If for any reason other than the end of an innings, an over is left uncompleted at the start of an interval or interruption, it shall be completed on resumption of play. Abdullah already mentioned it, that if a wicket falls in the last over before lunch, we are going to take lunch immediately. If we've only bowled three balls in that over, then it stands to reason that we will need to complete that over after lunch by bowling the remaining three balls. So what happens when a bowler is incapacitated or suspended during an over? If for any reason a bowler is incapacitated while running up to deliver the first ball of an over, or is incapacitated or suspended during an over, the umpire shall call and signal dead ball. Another bowler shall complete the over from the same end, provided that that replacement bowler 
has not bowled any part of the previous over and can not bowl any part of the next over. OK, this is where the law comes in saying that no bowler can bowl any part of two consecutive overs in the same innings. So that's the over. Pretty straightforward, and I'm sure we've all watched a lot of overs and also seen bowlers being replaced in the middle of an over due to injury or maybe even suspension. Now we move on to the last law of the evening before we get into our revision questions. Law 18, how do we score runs in cricket? Firstly, we need to know what is a run? The law says the score shall be reckoned by runs and a run is scored so often as the batters at any time while the ball is in play have crossed and made good their ground from end to end. Okay, from crease to crease. Of course, we can only we can also score uh, runs when a boundary is scored and when penalty runs are awarded. So those are your three categories of run scoring. We also have short runs in cricket. What is a short run? A run is short if a batter fails to make good his or her ground in terminating for a further run. Although a short run shortens the succeeding one, the latter, if completed, shall not be regarded as short. Okay, so if you are attempting to run two runs and you do not touch down at the non-striker's end, turn and go back to the striker's end. You've attempted two, you've completed the second run. It means that only one run was short, even though technically the second run was also not a complete run in terms of going from one crease to the next. Okay, this is what this law is saying. Of course, we also have the example of the likes of David Miller, who bats outside of his crease. Batters do not need to, after they've completed their shot from outside of the crease, they do not need to go back into their crease before running to the non-striker's crease to complete the single. Okay, a striker setting off for the first run from in front of the popping crease may do so without penalty. So let's look at how the law deals with unintentional short runs which is the most common of short runs. If either better runs a short run, the umpire concerned shall call and signal short run when the ball becomes dead and that run shall not be scored. If after either or both batters run short, a boundary is scored, the umpire concerned shall disregard the short running and shall not call or signal short run, but instead shall signal the boundary. If both batters run short on the same run, this shall be regarded as only one short run. If more than one run is short, then all runs called as short shall not be scored. A uh, question came up in our level one presentation earlier this year as to how do you get the message across to the scorers as to how many runs were short and how many were completed? Well, the short answer is that you don't. Um, so you signal short run and you then make sure at the end of the session or the next time that you're off the field and are able to speak to the scorers that they know that on ball 37.4 uh, four runs were attempted but two of them were short 
So only two runs should have been recorded. Um, however, in my 15 years of umpiring and 25 years of watching cricket, I've never seen a run more than one short run in one ball. Why? Because umpires always call and signal short run immediately as the batter has turned short. And so I can guarantee you that having heard the call of short run, they definitely will make sure that they complete the following run or runs that they are attempting on that particular delivery. So no umpire, as far as I know, has ever had the challenge of notifying the scorers that there were two runs short on a single delivery. Let's watch a video on short running, and it deals not only with unintentional short runs, but also intentional short runs or deliberate short runs. And Abdullah, if the sound doesn't come through, please let me know. Um, but I am quite confident that it should come through. Um, let me, in fact, let me just uh, reshare and include a sound. Hello guys, welcome to my channel. This video is a new addition to the analysis series. Let's get started. On 15th of November 2018, second day of second test match between Sri Lanka and England, a strange incident happened. Let's watch the footage. Looks like a normal short run case, isn't it? Well, that's not the case. Let's see what umpire's decision was. If you did not understand what he signaled, he initially disallowed all the runs scored by the batsman on that delivery. Further, he informed the batsman about deliberate short running and awarded 5 penalty runs to the fielding side. Now, let's see what the cricket law has to say about running short. There are two categories in this, unintentional and deliberate. Let's take a look at unintentional short running first. If a batsman runs short, then the umpire shall call and signal short run as soon as the ball becomes dead and that run shall not be scored. For example, if they run two and if they run one short, then only one run will be scored. Now, let's take a look at deliberate short run. Cricket law states that if either umpire considers that one or both the batsmen deliberately ran short, then wait for the ball to become dead and further disallow all the runs scored on that delivery, return the batsmen to their original end and award five penalty runs to the fielding side. Now, let's see why the umpire considered this incident as deliberate short running. As you can see, both the batsmen start running and then striker Roshan Silva feels that the ball will reach the boundary. But upon seeing Moin Ali has stopped the ball, he runs back to the striker's end. But in between, the striker Roshan Silva did not ground the bat at all, which made the umpire to consider this as deliberate short run. If he had at least tried to ground the bat, then most likely that the umpire would not have considered this as a deliberate short run. Fire and penalty for this feels a bit harsh, isn't it? Now let's see why exactly this law exists. In an IPL match between Mumbai Indians and Kings XI, while chasing 231, Mumbai Indians needed 16 runs of the last over. Kyron Pollard, who faces the first ball of the over, strikes the ball and sets off for the run thinking that he can come back for two. But upon realizing that he cannot make it, he runs back to the striker's end without completing the first run. And it can be seen that he 
he did that deliberately as he wanted to get back the strike. It is clearly unfair as he got one run and also he came back to the strike. To prevent the players from doing such things, this law exists. But in Roshan Silva's case, he was not trying to gain any unfair advantage. But since he did not make any effort to complete the first run, it was ruled deliberate short run. Still have any doubts with this? Do let me know in the comment section. If you like the video, then hit the like button and share with all your friends. If you have not subscribed yet, then don't forget to subscribe for more such contents. Thank you to the Cricket Digest for that informative video. Pretty much summarizing what I have said about unintentional short runs and what I'm about to summarize about deliberate short runs. And what's important about deliberate short runs is that quite often the match situation will dictate when a batter will attempt a deliberate short run. You saw a great example there of Kieran Pollard wanting to hog the strike in the last over of an IPL match. Um, very rare that you would find it in um, the longer format of the game, uh, like a test match. As you saw the example there with Roshan Silva, it was, it was more um, misjudgment and um, he thought the ball had gone for a boundary um, rather than an attempt to uh, gain an unfair advantage, right? So keep your eyes peeled for the deliberate short running in the closing stages of a limited overs match, uh, especially if a top order batter is batting with the tail, uh, he will always be looking to keep the strike, especially in the last over. So let's just recap on what we as umpires need to do when we discover a deliberate short run. The bowlers and umpire shall disallow all runs to the batting side, return any not out batters to their grounds, signal no ball or wide if applicable, Award five penalty runs to the fielding side. Okay. And then we need to implement the informing procedure where we inform the captain of the fielding side. As soon as practical, the captain of the batting side. And then we also have to report the particular incident because it is a incident of unfair play. The umpires together shall report the occurrence as soon as possible to the executive of the offending side and to any governing body responsible for the match who shall take such action as is considered appropriate against the captain, any other individuals concerned and if appropriate the entire team. Okay, it is regarded as cheating. As you saw, um, that was an attempt to gain an unfair advantage by Kieran Pollard. Uh, the umpires on that particular occasion um, were either not up to scratch with their laws or they were too scared to apply all of these directives that the law has listed. Okay, we need to be firm in terms of applying the law so that we cannot be seen as favoring or biased to either side. So let's move on to penalty runs. We've spoken about five penalty runs awarded to the fielding side for deliberate short runs. We also touched on a player returning to the field and coming into contact with the ball without permission of the umpires. We spoke about 
illegal fielding. Then there's also mention of illegal practice on the field. That can also be punished by five penalty runs. No balls and wides we know about. And the ball going through the wicketkeeper's legs and striking the helmet placed behind him, that would also be five penalty runs to the batting side. Okay, and then in Law 41 and 42, there are quite a few examples of five penalty runs being awarded to either side. We shall get to Law 41 later in this course. I'm sure we're all aware of boundaries and how they've scored, boundary six and a boundary four. And then the question is, can runs be scored when a batter is dismissed? When a batter is dismissed, any runs for penalties awarded to either side shall stand. No other runs shall be credited to the batting side except as follows. If a batter is dismissed obstructing the field, the batting side shall also score any runs completed before the offence, except if the obstruction prevented a catch being made, then no runs other than penalty runs shall be scored. If a batter is dismissed run out, batting side shall score any runs completed before the wicket was put down. So if the batter was run out on the third run, then the two runs completed before that third run, they will still count to that batter as well as the total of the batting side. How do we credit runs that were scored? Do they all go to the batter? Let's see what the law says. Unless stated otherwise, if the ball is struck by the bat, all runs scored by the batting side shall be credited to the striker, except for the following. An award of five penalty runs, which shall be scored as penalty runs. A one run penalty for no ball will always be scored as a no ball extra, not added to the batter's score, but of course to the total of the batting side score. If the ball is not struck by the bat, runs shall be scored as penalty runs, buys, leg buys, no ball extras or wides, whichever the case may be. If buys or leg buys accrue from a no ball, only the one run penalty for no ball shall be scored as noble extras, the remainder will be scored as buys or leg buys, whichever the case might be. And the bowler obviously gets debited runs in terms of their bowling figures. Let's see how that is done. All runs scored by the striker will be debited against the bowler. All runs scored as noble extras will be debited against the bowler, and all runs scored as wides shall be debited against the bowlers. In limited overs cricket, this can be somewhat um, punishing for the bowler, the noble extras, because you do get no balls which are the fault of fielders infringing on fielding restrictions but unfortunately uh, those noble extras all go against the bowler's name so there you have it that is all the laws that we are going to cover for this evening now we're going to move on to revision questions which are going to help us prepare for our level two exam when it comes in the middle of August. And I'm going to ask uh, Abdullah to look through the candidates list and see who has their hands up to help me answer these questions. 
The first question is regards to the toss. And Abdullah took us through who must be at the toss, what time must the toss take place, what is exchanged at the toss, and when a decision is made, um, can it be reversed? So we need all of those details for six marks, and we're going to ask at least four of you to contribute. So the first question I'm going to ask is, what time can the toss take place? Please, Dula, any volunteers? Uh, yes, Tom, we have uh, lots of volunteers. The uh, first and up was Swapnil. Swapnil, if you can unmute yourself and, um, uh, and give the first part of the answer to Tom. Uh, toss can be done not earlier than 30 minutes, not later than 15 minutes before the scheduled or rescheduled time for start of play. Perfect, Swapnil. Very important words that you use there, scheduled or rescheduled. You do get an extra mark for putting those two. Obviously, the times are the most important. Um, no earlier than 30 minutes before, no later than 15 minutes before the scheduled or rescheduled start of play. Uh, Dula, next I'm going to ask for who needs to be present at the toss and also where does the toss take place? Uh, Tom, Jitendra had his hand up next. Jitendra, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, so who need to present? Yeah, so for that the answer is uh, it, it, in presence of one or both the umpires and definitely both the captains. So that was the first part. And the second part was uh, uh, where it shall be on the field of play. Uh, it shall be on the field of play. Yeah. Perfect. Well done, Jitendra. That's uh, exactly the answer I was looking for. Thank you. And then, um, Abdullah, next I'd like to know what is exchanged at the toss? Something needs to be exchanged at the toss. Amarjit, your hand was up next. If you can unmute yourself. Uh, Amarjit, can you unmute yourself? Okay, I'll go on to the next one, the Tom. Uh, oh, there is he, Amarjit, yeah. I yes, can yes. hear you clearly. Uh, the decision that after the talk, toss to the handover, that uh, decision to be bat or ball, to decide uh, to tell the opposite captain and umpire. Okay, um, that's one of the things that needs to happen is the captain that wins the toss needs to decide whether they're going to bat or bowl, and they will inform the opposing captain as well as the umpire or umpires. Uh, but there's an important piece of documentation that needs to be exchanged. Abdullah, any other volunteers? No, oh, there's lots, Tom. Uh, Sasikant, you're next. Can you unmute yourself, please? Uh, all the team list has to be handed over. To, uh, it has to be exchanged between the captains. 100% Shashi Khan, that's the answer I was looking for. The team sheets need to be exchanged between the two captains. And um, depending on what level you're playing at international cricket, I think they go up to five team sheets per team. One goes to the opposition team, one goes to the umpires, one goes to the commentators, one goes to the match referee, and one goes to the scorers. So... Uh, quite a lot of team sheets that need to be exchanged at international level. Uh, of course, what we need to do as umpires is to make sure that each one of those team sheets is exactly the same. So uh, you can't have Australia handing in five different team sheets for, for one match. Um, down at club cricket, uh, we only have one team sheet per team that is exchanged. And um, we often uh, debate whether or not we need 11 or 12 names on that team sheet. We only need 11 
names on a team sheet because uh, the substitute or substitutes that can field uh, in place of an injured nominated player, uh, they just need to be members of the club. They don't need to be specific people who have already been listed on that team sheet. Okay, so that's quite important. And then lastly, Abdullah, um, I want to know if I win the toss, uh, what do I have to do? And is it reversible? Do I have to do it immediately or do I have some time to think about my decision? Uh, Bavis, you can unmute yourself and give the answer to Tom. Uh, Bavis. I don't see any movement from Bavis. I'll go to the next uh, hand. Um, Arun, you can unmute yourself and answer Tom, please. Yeah, once the captain winning the toss makes a call and takes his decision, uh, the decision cannot be reversed. Perfect. Very it was important. Bavis, uh, yeah. Firstly, Thanks, Bavis. Um, the decision needs to be made immediately and once made it cannot be reversed thanks Pavesh. well done uh, well done to all of you uh, good thorough answers and again for six parts you're going to have to note quite a lot of information here uh, that i'll quickly read out captains shall toss for the choice of innings on the field of play in the presence of one or both umpires not earlier than 13 minutes, nor later than 15 minutes before the scheduled or rescheduled time for the start of play. Each captain shall nominate his or her players in writing. That's something we forgot to mention. It's in writing uh, to one of the umpires before the toss. The captain winning the toss shall notify the opposing captain and the umpires immediately of his or her decision to bat or bowl and this decision cannot be changed. Okay, well done. I think we got uh, six out of six there. Um, I don't think we would get penalized for not listing writing. Team sheet, I think is good enough. Next question. Uh, we just gone through Law 18, scoring runs. There are three ways that runs can be scored. Uh, all three quite straightforward. And if you had listened and watched the slide carefully, I'm sure you will remember what they are. And there's one or two obvious ones. And then maybe the third one is a little bit trickier. Abdullah, do we have anybody who can hazard a guess at how a run can be scored? Uh, yes, Tom, we do have a few hands. Um, uh, swap, Neil, your hands were um, with the race first. Can you give us one of the instances where a run can be scored? Sure. So when batters run, uh, when batter crosses and make their ground good at end to end. Perfect, Swap, Neil. Uh, that is a single, by definition, uh, the batters making their good their ground on the opposite ends. Uh, next one, Dula. Yeah, yeah. Um, Aaron, you can unmute yourself and give us um, the second one, please. Yeah, when the uh, ball crosses the boundary by pitching the pitching on the ground, then it's a four, a, basically a boundary. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, you do not need to differentiate between a boundary four and a boundary six. Uh, mm -hmm. By scoring a boundary, we score runs. So that is the second example. Thank you. Next, please, Dula. Um, Sandeep, if you can give us the third one, please. Yeah, uh, the run can be scored uh, through the penalty as well. I hope mm -hmm. this is a pretty one. Yes, runs are scored through penalty runs as well. Perfect. Let's uh, look at the textbook answers. Runs are scored so often as the batters at any time while the ball is in play have crossed and made good their ground from end to end. 
Okay, so I think guys, just please read through that definition carefully and make sure you jot it all down thoroughly in the exam. This is quite a popular question. Remember that all of these questions are from previous level two and level three exam questions and are likely to show up again in this coming level two exam. Uh, when a boundary is scored is pretty straightforward and when penalty runs are awarded also straightforward. Next question, Dula, and mm -hmm. I'm going to ask for four volunteers to tell me when is a side's innings considered to be complete? When is a side's innings considered to be complete? Once again, two or three easy examples and then uh, one or two tricky uh, ones that we need to answer there, we need to list. Yeah, Tom, there are several hands. I'm going to give um, those an opportunity that didn't answer a question yet. So, um, Njukuna, can you give us one of the ways that the size innings is complete? Yeah, um, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, when overs allotted are completed. That is correct, Njukuna. Uh, in a limited overs match, when allotted overs are completed, that is the end of that innings. Next, please, Dula. I'm over pronouncing the name correctly, Temi Tope. If you can unmute yourself and give us a, a second uh, way that an innings is completed. Temi Tope, if you can unmute yourself, the floor is yours. I'll go to the next name, um, Amarjit. If the floor is yours, can you, if you can unmute yourself, please. Oh, when the side is all out. When the side is all out, that's a straightforward one. Well done, Amarjit. Thank you. Next one, please, Dilla. Uh, uh, Nisan, you, you can give us the next one. Uh, when a captain declares the innings closed. When a captain declares an innings closed, very good example. Well done. Thanks, Tula. One more for us, please. I'm going um, next one. Uh, Margaret, can you give us the next one, please? The captain forfeits the innings. Forfeiture is also correct. Uh, that is a completed innings. Um, Abdullah, if I'm not mistaken, there's one or two more. Do we want to give uh, more people with hands up an option, an, an opportunity? Uh, yeah, um, uh, Timmy Tope, your hand is still raised. Um, can you unmute yourself and give us the next one, please? Yes, when they uh, meet the required numbers of runs, they meet to win. Can you hear that? Yes, no, I, I, I did. I did. Did you hear, Tom? I didn't hear. Um, yes, yes. He mentioned yes. Um, when the required number of runs have been scored, then um, the innings is completed, uh, which I think is correct. In 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 my head, it makes sense. Uh, it, it's basically the end of the match, and the innings would be completed as well. Shall we go for one more, Tula, or shall I uh, go through the textbook answer? Let's go for one more. But, um, let me have a look. I'm trying to give all, uh, um, new uh, new um, attendees the opportunity. I don't see any new hands. So, um, Sasikant, your hand was raised first. Uh, if the match is uh, co completed, uh, uh, with, uh, when the weather condition is not uh, due to the weather condition, we have to forfeit the game. Even that day, we can call it uh, the game is complete. No. Okay, I think let's. Uh, Abdullah, go for it. 
Yeah, the, um, there's a bit of confusion uh, to when an innings is complete and when a match is concluded. Mm. Correct. So, so there, there's just a bit of confusion. So um, what Sasikan gave us is when a match is concluded. That's correct, yes. I think the one that uh, they were looking for but couldn't find in their heads um, is number two. At the fall of a wicket or the retirement of a batter, further balls remain to be bowled, but no further batter is available to come in. Okay, that's the example of Bula used of a uh, top order batter being injured, and then with nine wickets down, uh, that top order batsman could not resume his or her innings, and therefore the innings was completed. Uh, we've mentioned the side is all out. We've mentioned that the captain declares and the cap or the captain forfeits the innings. We've mentioned number of overs, prescribed overs have been bowled. Nobody mentioned the prescribed time has expired. Okay, so for four marks, you need to mention either of those, any four of those six points. I'm not sure if uh, point number five would only count as one mark if you mentioned both. Uh, but please, guys, let's uh, let's try and remember number two. That's the one that we always forget. Okay, well done. Next question has to do with miscounting, and I mentioned the procedure. So the question says, you as the bowlers and umpire miscount? and over during the match. The seventh delivery bold is a no ball. Discuss and explain the procedure to follow and why you follow that procedure. Abdullah, hopefully none of these umpires on the call today have miscounted. I know I have. Um, Me too, Tom. I've done it many <laughs> times, actually. <laughs> Uh, what do we do if the seventh delivery is a no ball and we realize then that it was the seventh delivery after it's been bowled? Tom, I don't see any new hands. Um, the first hand raised was um, Amarjit. So, Amarjit, over to you. <clears throat> the seventh ball we, we consider as a legal delivery and after and if it is the no ball, still we, we count as a legal uh, no ball, and then we have to end the over. Okay, so we we end the call over. It as over. That's correct. We do call it as an over. Uh, if it's a no ball, it's not considered a legal delivery. However, it is extra run. No ball is an extra run, but we, we will not uh, give the free hit to the striker. Hello. Is it correct? Mm -hmm. uh, Amarjit, I, I think uh, Tom lost connectivity. Um, what was your last statement, please? What did you say? Uh, after the no ball, but we will not give the free hit to the batsman, to the striker. Yeah, it will then. Uh, it will then be the end of the over. Yes, it will be the end of the over yeah. and uh, no free hit to the strike. Cor yeah, correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Well done, Amarjit. Um, I got cut off due to uh, power failure here in uh, Cape Town, in my area, uh, but I'm back online using uh, personal hotspot. So, um, Abdullah, let me reshare my screen to yeah. complete the um questions revision questions Just give me one that. second right so 
So just reading through the textbook answer, if having miscounted, the umpire allows an over to continue after six valid deliveries have been bowled, he may subsequently call over as the ball becomes dead after any delivery, even if that delivery is not a valid ball. Okay, and that in fact was the last revision question for the day. Um, so well done to all of you. Uh, some very thorough uh, answers to those tricky questions. Now we're going to open up the floor to um, any questions posed on the chat box. Uh, Abdullah, I don't know if you've gone through and had a look at them yet. Uh, no, Tom, I, I somehow I, I can. I don't have access to the chat box. So uh, do you have access? Yes, I do. No problem. I shall go to the top and start with the first one. Um, Ashish asks, as a call of over does not mean a ball is dead, does the same apply for call of time? You want to take that one, Tula? The, uh, so my interpretation of uh, the call of over is that the ball is actually dead. Because according to the law, you only calling uh, or you should be calling over if, in your opinion, the ball is dead. So you need to wait until the ball is dead, and then you call over. So if you if you call over, then according to to you, the bowlers and umpire, the ball is dead. That's why you've called over. So my interpretation is that the moment you've uh, you've called over. And uh, because you thought you, uh, according to you, the ball is dead, you've called um, over. So I say once you've called over, the, um, the ball is dead. That's my interpretation, Tom. I agree with you, Dula, and that's why I mentioned um, while I was presenting that it's important for the umpire, the bowlers and umpire, not to rush to call over. They need to wait until both sides have considered the ball to be dead, both the batting side and the fielding side, before they, the umpire calls over. Um, I have had it before where the umpire called over prematurely and the batters were still deciding whether to run or not, and the fielding side still wanted to run the batters out, and it was chaos. Um, long story short, the umpire said that the ball was dead once he called over, which according to the law is not technically correct, uh, but it does make sense if you relate it to uh, rugby or football, where once the referee blows the whistle, nothing further can happen after that. So, um, So I would say that even though technically the ball does not become dead on the call of over, uh, pretty much it it nothing should happen after the oh, the bowler sorry the bowlers and umpire has called over. Uh, just don't get yourself into a tricky situation by calling over prematurely. Wait, wait, and wait some more until the ball is definitely dead before calling over. Okay, good question though, Ashish. Um, next, I'm going to move on to Musa's question. What if the miscount is five balls and over is called? Jula, what happens then? Musa, the, um, the balls as counted by uh, the umpire shall stand so if in this case, yes, even though it's a five ball over, as soon as over is called, yes, it was a mistake, but that over shall stand. That's true, Dula. Um, however, if your partner corrects you and you are happy that your partner is correct and you were wrong, uh, then you can complete the over with a sixth ball. 
uh, it won't look good at all. Um, five ball overs don't look good. Seven over ball overs don't look good. Um, but in this case, I think it would be the right thing to do once you've decided between the two of you that only five balls were bowled is to correctly cancel the call of over and um, bowl the sixth legal delivery. But please, guys, uh, all of those things that I mentioned in terms of how not to miscount, please use those tips and tricks to minimize the miscounting. Next question is from Joshua. If a bowler delivered the six balls and both umpires realized on the seventh ball and the process of the seventh ball uh, gets a wicket, uh, does that wicket count? So wicket is taken on the seventh ball of an over to love. Uh, Josh? Uh, yes, the wicket uh, counts. The wicket shall count on the seventh ball. The the runs taken off that ball shall also uh, count. Uh, yes, unfortunately, you've allowed an extra uh, ball to be bowled in the over. You've realized it. Uh, but if a wicket gets taken off that sixth, seventh ball, uh, it will stand. And also any runs scored off the, off the, off the seventh ball will also stand. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Just scrolling through the questions. Let us assume a hypothetical scenario where a bowler bowled five valid balls in the ninth over and the umpire miscounted, called end of over immediately next bowler bowls a valid ball then the scorer informs the on-field umpires what happens then as soon as the um, uh, the you've called over uh, the the five ball over shall stand uh, you cannot now rectify that over in the next over by bowling a, let's say, a seventh ball over. So now you'll say, let us bowl one ball. It will now complete the previous over and, and will then uh, uh, bowl six balls afterwards. No, Th that five ball over shall stand. Yes, you've made a mistake, uh, unfortunately, uh, but it will stand. The following over needs to be um, a six ball ball over or six valid balls needs to be bowled. So again, as, as Tom emphasized, it's so important that the two umpires make sure that they do get the counting um, correct on the field. That's why we do have uh, signals um, where we, like in the Western Cape, we do go three balls left in the over, two to go, uh, one to go at at international level, it's it's nice. There are scoreboards. You do have a TV umpire that you can rely on. But at club cricket level, it's the it's the two uh, umpires on the field, and that's why um, getting um, making sure that you count correctly, having the the appropriate signals to make sure that you counted the correct balls in the over. Thanks, Tom. Next question is from Juguna. Uh, we're still on the uh, miscounting. It seems mm -hmm. like a, a very popular <laughs> habit. <laughs> um, and I think you have answered it before. Just, just to clarify, if the seventh ball bowled is a no ball, will the seventh ball be counted for a run despite the free hit not being awarded for the next ball? Uh, yes, the, all, uh, any run scored off that seven ball will count. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, even if a wicket gets taken, uh, that will also count. But in this example, I think he said the seventh ball was a no ball. So, um, so I don't think a wicket was taken. But to answer the question, I, um, yes, the run, the run score of that particular ball shall stand. But the ball will not be uh, bowled. You will, after that seventh ball, you will call um, over. 
and um, the next over will then be completed from the other side. Uh, yeah, Tom, if I can just uh, add a bit of, uh, a bit of field graft, and, and I've done this uh, quite a few times, uh, especially in in uh, 20 over cricket or even 50 over cricket, uh, where the, the game is uh, tight, and I'm now referring mm -hmm. to club cricket. So the game is the tight. You're looking at, let's say, um, 20 balls left, 25 runs to um to get so tight yeah. game um club cricket um so let's say it's the the fourth ball of the over you look at your partner and your partners uh, you saw your partner two and your partner uh, looks at you and he say one left so according to you there's two according to your partners one so he's adamant there's two there's one left you you say there's two so what do you do so I've done this a few times, as I said, limited over tight game. I've, in those cases, I've just shouted to the scorers, or I've asked one of the fielders closer to the scorers, just ask the scorers how many balls left in the over. The, the, the fielder will then ask the scorers, one or two balls left, the scorers will confirm, let's say, two balls left, and, and then um, we will then play according to the, the balls that the scorer have left. For me, I want to get the correct decision. Yes, it, did, it doesn't look good if you ask the scorers how many balls left, but I'd rather get the, the correct number of balls uh, um, um, spot on than just imagine you allow uh, um, um, only, let's say, a single ball in the over. At the end of the game, side B loses by one run, and now the scorers... Uh, broadcasted by saying, yeah, but the, the, the third loss or the fourth loss over of the game, there was a five ball um, over. Uh, I'd rather ask, get confirmation from the scorers. It's some, it takes you about 10, 15 seconds uh, to get the correct number of balls. I, I'd rather do it that way. I've done it a few times, Tom. I, I'm not sure if you've done it at club level. I agree with you 100%, Abdullah. Um, that little bit of embarrassment asking the scorers is far better than a huge embarrassment at the end of the game if you miscounted in a tight match so uh yeah great uh, bit of advice for umpires if they're not sure to check with the scorers before calling over or before bowling the next ball next question is from swapnil he says, in the exam, do we have to write word to word the answers from the law book? Uh, or can we write the answers using important terms and phrases and still get good grades? Um, Swapnil, we do not expect you to um, memorize the law book and regurgitate it verbatim. In fact, uh, whenever umpires or candidates write uh, directly from the law book, then we worry that they had the textbook open or the law book open when they were answering their um, exam, which, as I mentioned last week, Wednesday is not allowed. This is a closed book exam. So you just need to understand and know how to apply the law and be able to um, adequately describe it on paper. OK, so no need for regurgitation or memorizing of the law, but you definitely need to understand what the law is trying to say. And if you can remember words such as scheduled or rescheduled start of play, um, then that will look very good on your answer sheet. Uh, but no need to uh, memorize the law book. Uh, next question is from Bavesh. After the striker has hit the ball and the ball falls in two parts while heading towards the boundary but did not reach, what are the actions that need to be taken by the umpire? That's a rather interesting scenario. Dula, you want to handle that? <laughs> yes, I'll, uh, I'll take this one. The um, I'll, I'll allow play to continue. They need to return that uh, half a part of the ball uh, 
to the keeper and uh, once the ball is uh, then dead, I'll allow those runs. Uh, I will not, um, yes, if the ball split in two, um, I'm going to allow play to continue. I'm not going to call uh, um, a dead ball because the ball uh, um, split it in two. Um, uh, same applies to a bat when a bat um, gets broken in, in two and, uh, and the batter starts uh, to run. Uh, play will continue, you'll allow the better to run. I don't know if you will handle it differently, Tom, or you, if you will add something, you want to add something to it? No, that sounds pretty logical to me, Dula. Um, the ball is still live, and even though it's half a ball, it still forms part of a ball to be thrown into the wicket keeper. Obviously, uh, after all is said and done, then that ball will need to be changed. Next question is from Ramesh. Uh, interesting one. If a bowler is incapacitated during the run-up of his first delivery and he does not bowl that first delivery, so and then does not bowl any of that over. Is it possible for that bowler, having now recovered, to bowl the next over from the other end? I don't know the answer to that, so I'll leave it over to you, Abdullah. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. The um, According to the law, a bowler is not allowed to bowl two consecutive overs. So in this scenario, as soon as the bowler takes that first step, the over has started. Even mm. though we didn't bowl a ball, but the moment he takes that first step, that over officially started. So, yes, he took his first few steps. He then, let's say, uh, pulled the hammy, became inca incapacitated, but, but that over has started. So now it's n this bowler is not allowed to bowl the very next over from the other side because according to the law, you're not allowed to bowl two overs consecutively. That's correct, Dulas. So because he started the run-up, that means he has technically bowled or technically been part of that over. So he may not be part of um the next over yep perfect makes sense very good question thank you ramesh um next question is from tinku just asking me to send um the link to his email address which i will do and then we have a bowl a question from ivan de jong the ball comes into play Bowler starts his run-up of the seventh ball of the over. The strikers and umpire realizes that six valid balls have been bowled. Can the umpire call dead ball and call over, or does the seventh ball have to be bowled? Oh, the umpire is leaving it up for the 11th hour, uh, but if... You can stop that ball from being bowled. If you, you realize um, that six valid balls has been bowled, and if you can stop the bowler from bowling that ball, by all means, uh, stop him. But as soon as he's bowled the ball, uh, you cannot now say, no, guys, sorry, uh, dead ball. You shouldn't have bowled the, the, um, the ball because it was the seventh ball. So um, up until the ball is being bowled, if you can stop him, by all means, no problem. But as soon as that ball is bowled, that ball uh, will count. Um, we could, uh, if it takes a wicket off the ball, it will count. Runs off that ball will count. Perfect. Thanks, Dula. Um, that is all the questions on the chat. We'll see Joshua has just put on another one. Um, Joshua, before we come back to yours, I see Jitendra has had uh, his hand up for quite a while. Jitendra, do you have a question for us? Or is that an old end? No, yeah, I do have a question. Yeah, this question is a uh, 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 lot about uh, the laws, what we are going across. The question is about uh, understanding the format for the exam, level two exam, which we are approaching. So the question is, uh, are we going to 
write only the laws of the cricket or are we going to use any training conditions also so let let me be a little more clearer in this like for example uh, there was a scenario just a little while earlier like uh, if the seventh ball is a no ball and we sh we are not allow going to allow the free hit so the free hit is basically is a playing condition so those things we are not going to write it or are we going to use the playing condition also when we are going to write the exam level to exam which we are approaching for very good question jitendra um i thought i'd mentioned it on the first lecture but uh, maybe i didn't or maybe you missed it the level two exam is based only on the laws of cricket. So no free hits and uh, no fielding restriction circle, et cetera, et cetera. It's only on the laws of cricket. And that is why the presentation is only on the laws of cricket. So that is the short answer. Uh, level three does throw in some playing conditions, uh, but those playing conditions are also listed on the actual question paper of uh, level three, but for level two, there's absolutely no playing conditions. All the questions and all the answers refer to the law book code 2017 edition one. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Uh, Joshua asks if a bowler delivers a fair delivery and the ball splits into two and one part goes for four runs. Can runs count? Uh, Abdullah, you seem to know about split balls. I'll give that <laughs> one to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Yes, I am the expert in split balls. Josh, <laughs> thanks for your question. Uh, yes, Josh. Uh, even though only half the ball went over the boundary, it's still part of the the ball and that four runs uh, shall count. Uh, again, I want to use uh, the batter as a, a, just another example. So uh, uh, let's say a, a batsman uh, hits the ball and the bat breaks in half and, and the bottom part of the bat goes in the air and lands onto the stumps. The batsman will be dismissed. You'll probably say, yeah, but uh, I've got half the bat in my hand. The other half is not part of the bat. It's still part of the bat and it can be dismissed. So in your in this scenario, yes, only half of the ball went over the boundary. It's still part of the 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 ball and at four runs uh, shall count, Josh. Thanks, Dula. We've got two more hands in the air. Uh, Bavesh, you are listed first. Do you have a question for us? Please unmute your microphone. Go ahead. Thank you, Tom. Um, I have a question for you uh, in during your presentation about uh, unintentional short runs uh, and deliberate short run. You shared with us the video about uh, Sri Lanka versus England uh, scenario where South African Empire given the disallow all the runs uh, and the penalty five runs and another slide which was from IPL where uh, Kian Pollard have deliberately did the short run. But it's just for my confusion, the deliberate was actually did, did by the Pollard, where I'll see in other scenario where Sri Lankan batsman was not did it deliberately, but still he was uh, awarded with the penalty with the fire and so. That's something I didn't get it, so I thought to ask him. That's a good question, Babesh. And if you will remember, the uh, narrators mentioned that the Sri Lankan batter was not looking to gain an unfair advantage. However, he definitely knowingly did not ground his bat beyond the popping crease. So even though the intention was not to cheat, unfortunately, it was a deliberate short run by definition because he knew that he did not make good his ground in the opposite end and then ran back, seeing that the ball was coming back from Moen Ali uh, to make good his ground at the wicketkeeper's end. He then uh, ran to make sure that He's not run out. 
Um, the Kieran Pollard incident was probably the best uh, example of a deliberate short run in terms of match situation. And you see that he even looks at the umpire when he turns short. Uh, so he knew that he was cheating. Um, the umpires were unfortunately, like I mentioned, either not knowledgeable on the law or were too scared of a big name player to um, apply all of the law that uh, Murray Rasmus had applied um, in the previous example to the Sri Lankan batsman. Cancel all runs to the batting side return them to their original ends and uh, award five penalty runs to the uh, fielding side. So although it wasn't an attempt to gain an unfair advantage, it is still by definition a deliberate short run. And that is why Murray Rasmus applied all of those um, punishments that the law requires to do so. I hope that answers your question, Babesh. Yes, Tom. Thank you very much for your detailed answer. And now I'm satisfied. You're welcome. Next hand up is Nanesh. Please unmute your microphone and let us know what you would like to know. Uh, good evening, Tom and Abdullah and everyone. Um, the question, the first one is uh, about the bowler uh, starts his run up and he did not bowl the first ball and he wants to come back and bowl the second over, for example, if it's start of the innings. And you already gave the uh, answer that um, he cannot bowl the second over, but he can bowl the third over of the innings. So that means he started his bowling run up. So that means that bowler starts run up and did not bowl a first ball. Uh, does it also count as one over for the bowler? No, that does not. So, yeah, that's the thing because when he bowls an over, then we say uh, you cannot bowl the next over. So that's fair enough. But in this case, the bow this. Uh, over does not count as one for the bowler, but still uh, he cannot bowl the next over. Yes. But, uh, Tom, do you mind me answering this? Sorry. Uh, Nanesh, uh, yes, it counts as one of for the over. So we are applying the law here because he takes that, uh, he took that first step. So i.e. it means the over, uh, his over has technically started. Uh, yes even though he did not bowl a ball because he took his first step, he's over technically started and unfortunately it will count as one um, uh, um, one of um, one of the overs of his spell. So if, if this would be a let's say a 50 over game where he's only allowed 10 um, overs um, 10 overs um, that will count count as one of the over and he will only be allowed to complete nine further overs. Thank you, Abdullah. You're welcome. That's very really interesting, Dula. <laughs> Good to know. And, yeah, thanks, Abdullah, really. Uh, and the next one is about calling time and removing the bales from the stumps. Um, mm -hmm. um, I saw some international MPs also, they call time um, at the end of the innings, but they're not even removing the bales in international matches. So do really umpires at international level do these things, uh, calling time, um, definitely they call the time, but do they remove the bales? Uh, just keep it for the bronze man to hand over those things. Uh. Um, uh, yes, uh, according to the laws of, of cricket, as soon as you call time, you need to remove the bells from the top of the stumps from both ends. But yes, you are correct in saying we've seen in practice that this doesn't happen uh, always. Um, there are many occasions where um, they, lots of umpires, I've seen it, that they 
they'll call time, let's say, for lunch, and they won't remove the bells from the top of the stump. They just walk, try to get to the change room as soon as possible. I don't know, maybe they're hungry. But according to the law, as soon as you call time, you have to remove the bells from the top of the stumps. But as you alluded to, a lot of time in practice, it doesn't always um, uh, happen. I don't know if yes. you want to add something there, Tom. Yeah, quite often what happens is um, if you are strikers and umpire, you are closer to the change room than you are to the stumps. So you're not going to still walk to the stumps and then walk to the change rooms for lunch. Uh, you can either ask the wicketkeeper to remove the bells or uh, the bells are left on and then the ground staff will uh, remove the bells. It's it's not one of those strict laws that has to happen. Um, it's 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 there in the book, so we need to know about it. Uh, yep. But it's not the end of the world if umpires do not remove the bells after calling time. Yes, and also does not affect um, the uh, result of the game, result of the match. So those are the things which really uh, affects the result of the match. And there are some things which will may good to follow uh, i do agree and the next one is not about the loss but it's about umpiring on the field uh, during the umpiring as well um, if i am allowed to ask those questions danesh can we um, get varun to ask uh, his question because he's had sure. his hand up for yeah. a long time sure definitely varun if you can unmute your microphone and give us your question yes sir. Uh, good evening tom good evening abdullah thanks thanks for the opportunity i have question regarding a uh, short run uh, so when do we signal uh, or call this uh, signal of uh, short run while the batsmen are still running or do we have to wait till the ball is dead uh, varun it's a uh, good practice to call and maybe even signal um, short run when it happens, but the ball still stays live and the match continues, similar to how you call and signal no ball for all the players to hear, but then you get into position for a run out before the ball is dead. And then when the ball is dead, then you signal short run to the scorers. So your first call and signal is to the players and you don't have to turn around to signal to the scorers because the ball is still live. You need to keep your eyes on the ball and you need to watch for runouts, be in position and to watch for runouts. And only when the ball is dead would you then turn towards the scorers and signal short run to the scorers. But as I said, to prevent a further short run, it's a good practice for you as the first short run happens to call and start to signal short run so that everyone is aware that that first run or the second run that was attempted was a short run. Okay, so two calls. Um, sorry, two signals. The first one is a call and a signal okay. to the players. And then the second one, when the ball is dead, you signal to the scorers. I hope that okay. answers your question, Varun. Yes, sir. Oh. sir. Right, sir. Thank you. Sir. But, uh, Tom, if you can just add, who does the signaling of short run to the scorers? Uh, very good point, uh, Dula. Um, so the initial call and signal is done by the umpire on whose end the short run occurs. But the final signal to the scorers is done by the bowler's end umpire, simply because um, the scorers are usually looking at the bowler's end umpire for signals. So very good point there, Dula. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Abdullah. You're welcome.
Uh, Nanesh, we've got another hand up from Nazmi, so we're going to take Nazmi's question first before we come back to you. Uh, Nazmi, please unmute your microphone and let us have your question. Nazmi, Hi, good evening, the floor Tom. Good evening, Abdullah. Good evening, all. Um, just on the short run, uh, Tom, um, I would just like to know. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Hi, hi, Tom. Um, just on the short run, um, what happens if you signal a short run for the first run, and eventually the ball goes over the boundary for the uh, for a four after the the first run, and the first run was a short run, and you signal signaled at the time when the run was short. To, does the boundary overpower the short run or does the short run still stand? So remember I said that when the short run occurs, you call and you signal, but that call and the signal is not for the scorers, it is for the players. And so the if the ball then subsequently goes over the boundary, um, then the boundary will stand and the short run will be cancelled. You do not have to show the cancellation signal, but what you will do is when you turn to the scorers, then you will only signal the boundary. And and in fact, I think the, the, the best practice here would be to to watch the ball to see that it's going to the boundary if you see that it's going to the boundary and the the batters turn short um don't call and signal short run um because you can see the ball is going to the boundary uh, then you only have to signal the boundary um so in short to answer your question the short run is thank you tom overruled by a boundary. Okay. Right. Um, Nanesh, you have your hand still up. You nobody yes. else does. You can ask your further question. Um, as I told you, it's not about the loss. It's about the empowering on the field. Um, it's mostly. Uh, of course, personal development as well. Uh, distractions during the match. Um, uh, for example, uh, if I give some uh, wrong decision and they made a mistake, and after a couple of minutes, um, I still sometimes keep thinking of that one. So, can you advise some? Uh, can you give some advice? How can I avoid that one? Um, just focus on the next ball rather than thinking of the old one, old mistake. A good question, Manesh, and yeah, uh, apologies to to any of the candidates still listening. Um, Nanesh has mentioned that it's not a question related to the material that we've covered. Uh, however, there are no more hands up, so we are happy to take his um, on field questions. Um, Nanesh, we all as umpires make mistake and even the best in the world do so. And actually a measure of the quality of an umpire is often how well they can bounce back from a mistake, especially uh, a mistake early in a match. It sets you on the back foot and you will naturally keep questioning each and every decision you make after that mistake. So it is very important to try and put it behind you as soon as you can because nothing that you can do can change that wrong decision that you've made. And all you can do is try at some point to assess why you got it wrong and then make sure you put measures in place that you do not repeat the mistake. And the less you are able to think about that mistake, the better your performance is likely to be for the rest of the day and the match. Um, one thing that I always advise umpires is that they should not try and cover up for their mistake. 
they should admit to their mistake if they realize it and if they are asked or questioned by a player. And you must definitely not try and make up for your mistake by making another mistake to favor the team that you have previously harmed. Okay, that is the worst thing you can do as an umpire is to try and make up for your mistake by um, another mistake. Um, it's not difficult. It's not easy. It's very difficult, especially if it's a it's a big decision. Um, players will often tell you it's a game changing decision. It's a career ending decision. Um, they'll try and use all of those words to to put more pressure on you so that you make a wrong decision in their favor. But try as far as possible going forward to make all of your decisions without fear or favor. And like I said, when you admit to a mistake, that is actually the end of the conversation. If you try and defend your mistake, then the players will keep coming at you and keep arguing about that mistake that you won't admit to for the entire rest of that match. Okay, so rather own up to the, a mistake that way you will be able to move on and that way the players will also be able to move on from it. Abdullah, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yes, and yes, just, just to add, uh, it also comes with experience, uh, Nanis. Uh, if I can take myself, um, in the beginning I used to beat up myself. Uh, uh, um, any mistake, mistakes I made, my head would drop. I would sulk, think of, you know, chew on it, I'll, I'll be nowhere um, sometimes for the rest of the session, the rest of, of the day. Uh, but from a player's point of view, there's nothing worse. Sometimes players can accept a mistake, uh, but if another mistake comes soon afterward, it just comp compounds, um, you know, the, the press on you. So what I'm saying, as, ex as you gain experience, uh, you will learn that you need to put it uh, behind you. It's important to put uh, the uh, the mistake behind you. So, so what I purposefully do as well is I owe up to the mistake. I try to to, to analyze it uh, quickly. Uh, sometimes it's uh, the, uh, because the very next ball is important. So this uh, analysis needs to happen uh, quickly. Uh, if you do need to, to give a detailed analysis, leave it till the end of the day where you can have a debrief and chat to your partner and think about it. And if there's camera footage, you can go, go look at it. But, this, but you need to think, put it behind you and focus on the very next ball. So the, that very next ball is important important then I talk to myself uh, you know keep up strong body language you know keep the head up uh, focus now even more uh, sometimes it was uh, um, the error was because maybe you didn't focus enough that could, could be a reason now just lift your head up uh, focus speak to yourself get the next uh, de decision um, uh, right so and players do look at it they do look at uh, um, uh, especially if everyone knows you made a mistake, they will remind you of the mistake. They'll try to put press on you, but by uh, you know keeping the chin up, strong body language, you know f focusing, not letting, not letting the your your head uh, drop or your your body language uh, drop. For me, that really helps me keeping me uh, in the zone. Uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Thank you, Abdullah. You're welcome, Nanesh. I think, yeah, very good and, um, and experience that we can all learn from. And uh, these are these are the type of things that improve all of us as umpires. So thanks for sharing, Nanesh. And I hope uh, yes, and not oh, too many one errors more. ahead. Uh, I hope so. I will try my level best. <laughs> and tomorrow, um, uh, I need I have an appointment to do umpiring at um, a practice match, but it's a higher level, higher match uh, with the ICC match regulations. Uh, because the national team are preparing for the T20 World Cup, so I got an opportunity to do uh, the umpiring in that match. 
Uh, I am a little bit excited. <laughs> I am a bit excited as well. So I just want to um, uh, get some advice from you. Um, how to be uh, not so that exciting and can you give some advice um, uh, yeah, you think... already face this one uh, i think everybody has this one when they get chance to do higher level uh, probably yeah. they will get this feeling uh, if i believe if i'm not wrong yeah i think what you need to do nanesh is you need to remember that it's just another game of cricket it's 11 players per side. It's uh, bats and balls and the stumps are the same size. And all you need to do is keep doing what you have been doing. Um, routine breeds consistency and players at all level, all they want is consistency. Obviously, you need to be good consistently rather than bad consistently. So make sure that you're routines are good routines you've built in good habits into your pre-match and your uh, set up routines um, as a bowler is running up to bowl what is your switch up position what is your switch down position after the delivery has gone dead uh, make sure that you keep talking to yourself that's the way that i am able to calm myself down and to take my thoughts off negative um, feelings is to talk positive feelings. Like Abdullah said, make sure your head is up, your body language is strong, and you are focusing on only the next ball because the most important ball of every match is the next ball. You can't change anything prior to what has happened and you cannot predict what is going to happen next. So just treat every ball as if it's the most important ball of the match because the next one always is. And if you do go through a difficult time, just remind yourself that you have been through a difficult match before and you've come through it a better umpire. So keep the positive affirmations going in your head. Speak them out loud if you have to. Breathe in, breathe out, and enjoy it, most importantly. Um, because if you're stressed the whole match, then you are bound to make a mistake. But if you take it all in and actually enjoy the occasion, you'll more likely than not do well. Um, any last bits of advice from you, Abdullah? Oh, you've summed it up well. You've covered everything. Um, all the best for your game, uh, Nanesh. Uh, maybe you, on Bella. Monday, uh, maybe Monday uh, um, after the Q and A session, um, you can give us a bit of feedback how the game went, Nanesh. No, no, not Monday. Sure, what is today? Uh, when, Wednesday. Uh, what is today? Yeah. Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. Wednesday after the Q and A session. Yeah. Please give us uh, uh, um, a bit of feedback how the game went. Sure, Abdullah. And if you want to, um, you can also post a streaming link in this chat. Even after the uh, chat has ended, you can still post to this call. So, so, and and we will be notified on our Microsoft Teams of that link. So, so I think that would be great uh, if you can do that, uh, Nanesh. And all the best to you. Yes, thank you, Tom. Pavesh, one last question from your side. Uh, yes, I completely forgot. It's it's not about the law, but it's about the tools. Uh, you did forward me uh, last month uh, uh, about the person who is in charge, who is uh, arranging the uh, bad gauge and the ball gauge. Yes. Uh, I also, it is from my end also to follow up. I also didn't follow up and I also did not receive an email from one of the person who was from India. Uh, but now I'm back in the Netherlands and I'm still wondering if, if that is a possibility. So the gentleman is based in Durban in South Africa. Um, so there will be quite some heavy um, fees involved in terms of couriering the um, gauges to you. But um, I'm quite sure he still has some. 
and uh, what I'll do is I will quickly put his email address in the chat box and you can get a hold of him. His name is Mohammed Juma and um, he actually sometimes joins our uh, level one, two and three courses. He is a trainer in his association as well, uh, but I haven't seen him today, but I will post his uh, email address in the chat box now and he is quite um, receptive on email so i'm sure he will get back to you and what i will do is i'll just alert him to the fact that you will be contacting him soon yeah thanks tom uh, he can also deliver any in uh, any of the address in india that would also be fine then i can try to get it uh, myself, uh, uh, but thanks, thanks, Tom. Okay, you're welcome. Right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is now five minutes before 9 p.m. South African time. Uh, we have gone well over our scheduled close of 8 p.m. I, I think this is a rescheduled close of uh, 9 p.m. Uh, thank you once again for your interaction. Uh, this is how we all learn. Uh, I've been presenting for the last five years and quite often I'm still learning on every course. So I thank you for your participation and we will send out the recording of the meeting about an hour from now. In fact, because I don't have any electricity, I don't have Wi-Fi at the moment, I'm using my phone as a hotspot. I will only send out the recording tomorrow morning when the Wi-Fi is back up. Have a good evening, stay safe, and we shall chat again on Wednesday when we will be covering laws 2021 20, and 22, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you very much and good night, everybody. Thanks. Thank Thanks very much. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Tom Abdullah. Goodbye. Uh, you're welcome, guys. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye, everyone.